Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1. V13, Chapter 158 The Senate Shadow. Written by P. W. O. Falcon. In the Ellie's regional capital of Havkristen, Romanian troops discovered two U.S. soldiers crucified inside what is believed to be a cellar. Since NATO troops took the city tensions have been high as many of the city populations reject Western ideas. While the military government, Colonel Louis Grant from the 2nd Armored Division stated that violence is down, rogue loyalists are still committing terrorist acts. The colonel against states to the citizens of Havkristen that NATO will not abolish slavery until a formal treaty is signed, explained in detail how it would be done in a fair war. Colonel Grant found the four terrorists who did this and are awaiting trial. Three of them are human and the last one is Puka who owned a slave market. The Ellie's region economy is agriculture, which needs a large slave base labor force to harvest the fields of crops. Farmers are worried to go broke and starve if they cannot harvest their food. In an attempt to establish better relations with NATO, the people of Havkristen nominated NATO of the Carthid clan, from Lake Carthid. NATO is a Darfelon. His clan trade with the city and they have a trusted relationship. They agreed to represent the occupied towns of Ellie's to see if the NATO trade agreement has merit in transforming Ellie's economy, away from a slave labor economy. Jessica Moore. Sadira, Gladiator Arena. March 16, 2026. Senator Kaiso I.D. Chueli leans forward at the private senatorial booth at the Sadira Arena. He watches the three humans, one elf and one dwarf gladiator go up against one minotaur. It doesn't seem like an even fight. Castle El Tiberius said. He then eats a grape. You should come to the games more, Chueli said. While the Minotaur is outnumbered five to one, never underestimate their brute strength. If he does lose, he probably will kill four of them before death. I understand the rules, Tiberius replies as he drinks his water. The sport just never entertained me that much. Regardless, it is a good way to conduct business, Baron Monterey replies. To get away from the Senate floor. I find it easier to think here. There is something simple being here, watching these gladiators fight to the death. You find this peaceful? Tiberius asked, surprised by that. You sound like someone who has never seen war in his life. I served my country long ago in the Imperial Army. I was with Molt in the campaigns against Famulis. Monterey said. But look. These gladiators are fighting to the death, nothing to lose but honor and glory. Because your opponent is stronger does not mean they will win. You will be surprised by how many creative tactics these people come up with. I find their creativity inspiring and motivational. He drinks some wine and chuckles after hearing all that. That sounds like something Crisis would say. Do not insult me, Monterey quickly responds. Insult maybe but while all we do here is gossip like women crisis at least fought and died for the cause we say we follow. Tiberius states. He looks over to his good friend Senator Tiberius. He is one of the oldest and most respectable senators in the Imperial Senate, having a great amount of influence. Because of him the pro-war faction still has to listen to the pro-peace faction. He is a very principled man, still, believing in the old ways when the empire was once a republic. He then looks to Senator Monterey, the leader of the neutral faction in the Senate. While he and his few senators frustrate the other two factions, they have been able to maintain a careful balance of power in the government. He carefully sides with the pro-war faction on some topics and then the pro-peace faction on others. True, Tiberius said. Then let us get to business then. Zorzal's new wife. I don't trust her, Monterey bluntly says. Emperor Zorzal can screw whoever he wants, but this is a step too far. I didn't spend a decade of my youth fighting her armies, and putting her back into her place just for her to become the most powerful person in the empire. He knows what Monterey said was a bit hyperbolic, but not far from the truth. While Zorzal is the leader, Famulize is smart enough to know how to operate from behind. She is too smart not to use Zorzal's ability to make friends with the people around him to spread her influence. He thinks carefully about how to respond. Emperor Zorzal L. Caesar hosted a summit at Napnai with the other regional powers on Falmart. While more kingdoms and organizations arrived than expected, 
the two targets were the Tikarit conglomerate and Queen Famulis of the Scorless Kingdom. While both the war faction and neutral faction have different reasons for continuing the war, both are worried about the fact that losing the war against the other worlders will collapse the empire, bring the continent with it. While the summit was successful in creating a coalition against the other worlders or now formerly known as NATO, many believe the price is too high. When Zorzal came back from Napnai, he announced that he and are going to be married solidify their alliance. While the other countries wanted territory, slaves, gold, and other treasure, all she wanted was to be in this marriage and in return, she promised the full weight of her kingdom. She is up to something, he states. Succubus is not known to be political. We degraded the succubus and incubus races to just be harmless subjects. But Famulis, she is a beast all on her own. If it wasn't for Emperor Molt and his war against her, her kingdom might have been able to topple the empire three decades ago, Monterey said as he eats some grapes. I wonder what her plan is? Isn't it obvious? He replies. It's the same thing that bitch always talks about. Normalizing the demihuman races. She is planning on hijacking the empire. I came up with the same conclusion, Tiberius states. The empire is in a weakened state and desperate to win. That means she found an opening to sneak into the empire. I can support asking her and the Tikarit conglomerate support, Monterey said. Zorzal is correct to form a regional coalition against these other worlders. They are in the same boat as we are. If the empire falls then there's nothing stopping the other worlders from attacking them next. It is a now or never situation. You believe that idiot. He replies as he looks over to Monterey. I know Zorzal didn't start this war, but this is insane. The problem with your peace faction is that you don't see the bigger picture, Monterey said. Same with the war faction. Zorzal is no leader however you keep underestimating him. The war side also underestimates him. The summit was his idea, calling for unity with our traditional enemies was also his idea. That was a smart move. I see what you are saying, Tiberius responds. Zorzal doesn't care about traditions. He doesn't care about orc or man. He doesn't care if his sex slave is a human woman or a succubus, or even from this world. He nods hearing that, seeing what Monterey point is. While we laughed behind his back, we didn't see what was really happening. Molt never would do such a summit to call on our enemies to help us. He doesn't understand or cares about the historical reasons and why we need to keep them in check. He just cares about that throne. Yup, Monterey said. I saw this coming long ago. I am not implying this was some grand plan, but he doesn't follow our rules. Just like a gladiator that is an underdog. He changes the rules so he can win. We value obeying our gentlemen and nobility standards while he does what he wants, damn the results. Dangerous, but out of the box, he mumbles, reflecting on past events. We should have something like this coming. We opened the door for families and others to exploit us. Monterey then leans back after watching one of the humans get torn apart by the Minotaur. Tomorrow is the final approval for the Fallmart League, Monterey said. On top of that, tomorrow is the official day Zorzal and Famulis will become married. While I do not agree with this marriage, I do not see any other option to remain independent from the Americans' rule. I take it you will be voting for both? He replies. For the alliance yes, Monterey responds. I see the value of the alliance, but the marriage is one step too far. I think we all can agree to that, Tiberius said. I will not trade one threat with another. At least the Americans and their friends are human. Monterey takes a drink from his wine glass. Yeah, but as Zorzal said, at least Famulis people are this world. We must remember, he says. Zorzal has his loyalists all over the place. But if we merge our two factions for this vote then we could challenge him on this marriage, maybe oppose him. Will you follow us, Baron? He glances over to Monterey and waits for his response. Right now, the Empire has the people's support. A major reason is that the war has been framed as a clash of civilizations. That NATO wants to take everything away from the people and force them to change. While that truth has been stretched, it is still true. 
While slavery isn't the only example, it is the biggest. Giving lesser people equal rights has been a strange concept for many. Last week, the idea was mocked on the Senate floor and on the streets of Sadira. Monterey stands up as he watches the Minotaur kill his last opponent. We must be very careful. I am a patriot, I do not want the empire to fall to the pages of history. I do not care what the lesser races think, it is better than what came before the empire. We must either win this war or hold the line until a new option arrives. Monterey then looks at them. Famulize terrifies me. I do not believe any of us will be killed but working side by side with orcs as equals. Zorzel only cares about two things, power and his next pussy. He does not care if Famulize is a common race, or a demihuman as long as he remains on the throne Famulize will be able to do as she pleases. She is brilliant. She must be stopped now, or we lose the empire to her. In return for your support against Famulize, we will support the formation of the Fallmart League, Tiberius says. Monterey places his fist on his hip. See you on the Senate floor tomorrow. He watches Monterey leave their booth and then looks to Tiberius. Can we trust him, Tueli? I believe so, Castle, he replies. If we pull this off and gain the two thirds vote, I will bet even some in the pro war faction will support us. Throw away the alliance and keep the marriage, or keep the alliance and throw away the marriage. He can't have both. I will talk with the other senators tonight, Tiberius says. Any break in our ranks and everything could fall apart. I shall go home and spend time with my family, he says. Both men stand up and bow before they leave the arena. Tueli home. As Tueli walks though the royal district of Sadira. The district has been rebuilt after the Americans raid destroying everything. While he has never seen a battlefield, it looked like one based on the many war stories he has heard. He sees some noble kids playing with these small flyers. NATO has dropped some flyers as a propaganda weapon, explaining that the empire started this war. They do not care for the life of the common people. That NATO supports freedom and liberty and not the subjection of the common folk. He found it humorous, realizing that the other worlders do not understand Sidereans. Most of the population used the flyers to wipe their bums or for fire. While he understands the message and value of the flyer. A message like this might be effective in their world but not on Fallmart. Slaves might like the message but as of now most citizens and free folk wouldn't see value in the message, which plays into the empire propaganda hands. He then looks around at the nobility homes, seeing that most of them have been rebuilt. The high-class royal shopping center has reopened. The bathing chambers and of course the brothel center all rebuilt. At the beginning of the war he knew the Americans were powerful but seeing all the death in the streets he knew waging war against them was pointless. The empire has a long history of beating powerful forces on Fallmart, losing very rarely. When he saw their massive flying wagons come over their walls like they were not even there, he fully understood that this new enemy is on a far greater level than the empire will never accomplish. He thought the other senators would see what he saw but it quickly became clear they didn't. Either they wanted revenge for the losses of friends and family, or they felt like they needed to regain or maintain their honor or some other silly excuse. He never had the most positive view of the Imperial Army, seeing them as self-entitled thugs who look for a reason to start fights. However, he sees fellow senators are wasting their lives away for a pointless crusade. In the beginning, he could understand the pro-war side of the Senate. If the Empire loses the war it could result in the breakup of the Empire, the collapse of the economy, and drive Fallmart into a new dark age. He just believes if they negotiate a treaty with the other worlders they could prevent the breakup of the empire. But now with the dark races and Queen Famulize becoming empress. Sometimes, he wonders if the world is just falling off a cliff and there is nothing he can do to stop it. Just like the old kingdoms and empires that came before, he wonders if the time has come for the empire to fall. That is the only reason he agreed to make a secret arrangement with the American spy organization called the Central Intelligence, Agency or CIA for short. He hates providing information to the enemy however he believes if the war ends sooner the sooner people stop dying. He sees his home and opens the door. Evening everyone. Papa is back from the Senate. He noticed that no one came to greet him and found that strange. 
After putting his outdoor robe away he walks inside his home. Wife. Sherry? If his wife and daughter didn't greet him, then his cat girl made Dalico, might, but she didn't respond either. Sherry? He yells. I am in here, Papa. Sherry yells. I am sorry, but I was entertaining your guests. Okay, he replies. Sherry has always been political, enjoying helping him out wherever she can. She always liked to be around during his meeting with the other senators. He then stops and he realizes he was not expecting guests tonight. He wonders if it is Agent James Garcia again. He has learned that Garcia likes to appear when he wants to without warning. He walks into the room and stops. His eyes widen as he sees who it is. The head of the Oprichnina, Svenhard Lapu's Moon. He sees Moon kneeling there, hand on Sherry's shoulder. I have heard that you are bright, but I never knew you were this smart. If you were a man you would be a powerful senator like your father. Moon said and then chuckles. Moon then stands up and looks at him. Senator Tuelli, it is great to see you. It has been a long time. He then walks over and hugs him. As Moon hugs him, he feels uncomfortable. It is not common for non-nobility to get this close to senators, especially touch them. Moon was known as the Emperor Monster, doing all the dark deeds the Empire needs to be done. He already knows that this is Moon showing he isn't afraid of the consequences. Nice to see you too, Svenhard, he replies. Did I forget that we had a meeting plan? I hope I didn't keep you waiting. Moon pats him on the shoulder and walks away. I am sorry, but I didn't send a runner to you earlier. This was a last-minute arrangement. I have been meaning to talk to you, but I have been very busy, with the war and all. He nods, being careful how he speaks. He then notices this boy sitting down on his sofa. Is this your boy? Oh, I am sorry, Moon said. He then turns around and brings his son around. This is my son Skotardi. He was traveling with me, learning how to do my job. One day I will take my father's position, Skotardi said with a smile. It is nice to meet you Senator Chueli. Father has said great things about you. One of the few wise men in the Senate. A man of principle. He thanks Skotardi but wonders how truthful the boy is being. I heard about you and your sister, he replies. Moon pat his son on the shoulder. I believe your daughter and my son are about the same age, I figured it would be good for him to meet other kids his age. Maybe Sherry could teach him a thing or two while we waited. Well thank you, Sherry said with a smile. I know I can't take office being a girl but I know I can be an influencer. Be like a wise woman. If you continue your studies, Sherry, he said. Thank you for keeping our guests occupied while I was at work. You may go now. Moon then kneels. Your father right. Sherry, do you mind taking Skotardi to your room while we men talk? It's imperial business. Sherry looks at her father. Father? He hesitates to reply but then nods. He noticed how Moon has politely taken control of his home without a fight. He watches both kids leave the room. All right Moon, what do you want? Moon walks over. I think you know already. Let's go out the front. Before he could respond Moon walks past him and heads out the front door. This frustrates him greatly. He allowed the CIA to install two listening devices in his home, to listen to meetings like this. The main room for politics and the back porch. While he doesn't know if Moon knows about the devices, he is being clever to avoid normal places to talk. He follows Moon outside. He is worried about what Skotardi might do to his daughter alone in the house. Not just being the son of Moon, a known murderer, and rapist, but also a believer of syphilis. Moon stops and places both of his hands on his hips. You know you have a lovely daughter. I mean it. She reminds me of my daughter a lot. Smart, very political. I cannot imagine having only one kid or losing them. Moon then looks at him. People do not understand my job. You know what keeps our world together, the empire together? We in the Oprichnina have to do the dirty things to keep the world going. 
how many I had to murder, to torture, to disappear, to rape. Dark races or common. Slave or citizen. Man or woman. Adult or child, just to keep this work from falling apart. And I know everything thinks that I am a crazy man who enjoys his work too much, Moon continues as he reflects. It is a bloody job and sometimes I wonder what would happen if I didn't do this. He then holds out his figure and wags it slowly. I remember when Malt was the emperor. Before I was the head of the Oprichnina, I was supposed to take care of Zorzel. He then glances away, looking at the moon Edos. I had to kill 55 of his sex slaves because they were pregnant or they knew too much. Sometimes both. He then chuckles after saying that. The emperor didn't want a bastard grandchild. So many screams. He finishes with a chuckle from some memories. He continues. He stands there terrified from what he just heard. He remembers talking to Castle El Tiberius and other senators on how Zorzal never had any bastards from all the slaves he raped. He never put a lot of thought behind it though and now he wished he did. He clearly can see why Moon is so good at his job, he is a monster. Moon takes a breath. The only reason I can do this important responsibility is all thanks to my wonderful wife. She is so supportive. I just hope I can prepare my children for this tough job. Hearing that last part, he glances down as he thinks about his wife and Sherry. Scotardi is with Sherry alone in the house and if he is only half of who his father is then she is in danger. Moon looks at him and suddenly looks surprised. I am so sorry Senator. I came out here to talk politics, but I rambled again. My wife always tells me not to ramble, it's how I get my bad reputation. Sade truth in life, wives seem to be always right. Family always gets me. He then walks over to him. He looks up at Moon and sees a cool calm look on his face. He takes a light breath, trying to relax. I assume you are here to talk about tomorrow's vote. Yes, Moon said. He then walks around him to get between him and the front door, so he cannot escape. It is a major vote. I hear you will be supporting the creation of the Fallmart League. I was surprised to hear that. I am against the war, he said. But that does not mean I want the empire to fall. The idea that we are working with the other powers of these lands, maybe we can find a way for all of us to live in peace. From what our spies tell us, these other worlders have something similar. You are talking about NATO, Moon continues. I believe the true name is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I have no idea what Atlantic means, but I found it humorous how plain their names are. No wonder they just call themselves NATO, sounds better, and is shorter. What do you know about it? He thinks about the latest war reports. Getting information about the enemy has been harder than expected. Getting spies around Alnus and their vassals have been a problem. Normally, people will tell anyone anything at the right price, but the locals in NATO territory seem to be surprisingly loyal to them. The other problem has become understanding the information. Learning what a tank is, an airplane, rockets, or what a radio is. Based on the latest reports it is a military alliance of allied nations, he said. From what I understand we attacked one, so the others came to help. That proves my position. It seems like an alliance like this helps them achieve peace between their neighbors. Maybe if we have one it will do the same. Interesting, Moon mumbles. I honestly didn't think of that. I guess this is why you are a powerful senator and I just run the Oprichnina. Moon thinks for a moment and smiles. I know my reputation and I know many in the Senate have a low opinion of me, but trust me, I have a lot of respect for you. I know we have different opinions on the future of the Empire. Even though you have opposed most of Zorzal war plans, it always came for the love of the Empire. I know where you stand on topics without needing to have a chat. Some of these other senators switch their positions so much, it makes me dizzy. He has been in politics all of his life. His father was in the Senate and his father beforehand and so on, almost to the founding of the Empire. He knows what he is being led. Let's be honest Moon, you oppose my plans to vote against Zorzal and Famulai's marriage. Moon seriously looks at him. You are right. Let us get to the point. 
I know you are voting against their marriage and that will be a very bad thing to do. Zorzal is the emperor, he replies. He can marry who he wants without senate support. This is just a formality. Moon places his hand on his chin as he thinks. On paper yes, but let us be honest. If the senator approves a vote of no confidence in the marriage, it will be a bad show for the people. What is keeping the people in line is that we are fighting and strong. The people would support this if we have a divided government on a topic like this. We must stand unified. The emperor has never cared about my opinion before, he replies. Of course, I would vote against it. Most likely the other anti-war senators will agree. Famulai's being empress would just risk more war. Let me be clear, Moon said. The only reason you and Tiberius are allowed to protest against the war is because I allow it. To act as a vent to the point of who is against so they don't take matters in their own hands. So, they stay in their homes and live their pointless lives believing they are being represented. But in the end, your side has no meaning. A victory here and there and you feel empowered, just as I wanted. He glares at Moon and starts to get angry. What is the meaning of this? Whose side are you on? You preach about fighting for the empire, doing all these evil acts in the name of the empire. It seems you are just an agent of Famulis. Politicians, Moon mumbles as he ignores him. You people think you are so intelligent because you are from noble bloodlines. That you wear expensive clothes and you speak proper and yet you never can see what is in front of you. Do not get me wrong, Moon continues. I am loyal to Zorzal. Everything I do is for him. Zorzal is a charismatic man who has a vision. But I am not a fool, I understand his weaknesses. Do not play games, he says as he takes a step towards him. You are plotting to take over the government. You are a follower of Syphilis. It was your idea to recruit Jasis and now Famulize, the embodiment of Syphilis. I question your loyalty Svenhard. Most of the Senate, even your pro-war allies will not support Syphilis over Edo's. Let us talk about that, Moon said. Where is Edo's? He notices a pause from Moon's question however he does not understand the question. The Empire has always been a follower of Edo's. Maintain stability. That's the core founding principle of the Empire. And where has that gotten us? Moon asks. Talin has lost all the major fights against these people. Edo's has not assisted us. Where are the other gods? None of them are here to help but one. Syphilis has provided backslash DA fresh new battle-hardened army. A strong leader, Queen Famulize. With Zorzal's ability to win allies over and Famulize's bold leadership we will be a force to reckon with. Hearing that he doesn't know how to respond. You know what will happen if she gains power? Her kind will become normalized. It will bring back the Dark Ages. But you know all that already. Why are you telling me this? Moon crosses his arms and shakes his head. Easy. Tomorrow you are going to vote for their marriage, a sign of support. I know you convinced Baron Monterey to side with you. If you vote against the marriage then he will side with you, giving you a two-thirds majority. He takes a deep breath as he sees where this is going. And if I vote for the marriage Baron will have no choice to support the marriage. Maybe even a few pro-peace senators. Correct, Moon states. The answer is no, he states. I will not sell out like that. Find someone else to play your games. Moon takes a frustrated breath and walks over to him. You old fool. Moon then wraps his arm around him and pulls him close. Look you damn fool. Let me make this clear. You and I have something in common, we are both fathers. I love my children. I raised both my son and daughter to take my place. Moon then holds him a bit closer, making sure he fully understands who is in control. I noticed your daughter is at age. I wonder if she has bled yet, I know mine has. My son is becoming a man and he will have to learn what it means to be a man and find a mate. Moon then calms himself down and smiles. My son is going to have to learn where to stick it. But you want to know something I have learned, we guys are a bit simple-minded, just sticking it in and out and calling it good. 
Do you want to know where I get most of my cruel ideas? Moon chuckles and holds out his hand, moving two figures close like he is pinching something in the air. My wife. And now my daughter is getting at that age, she has come up with some interesting ideas herself. Like mother, like daughter I guess. He said with a chuckle. I think it's because they have nothing sticking out between their legs so they have to be a little more creative. They scare me sometimes. Moon then points his finger on Tueli's chest. You see, I have a problem. If you don't vote for both bills tomorrow, I do not know who I am going to give your daughter to. My son or daughter? After hearing all that he glances at Moon. He sees this calm but determines the look. He cannot believe how evil this man is, but he also cannot believe that it is his whole family too. He then starts to imagine what will happen to Sherry if he doesn't vote his way. He notices there is nothing but pure silence after Moon rant, letting his mind imagine every horrible thing that could happen to his daughter. He takes a deep breath and nods. Don't hurt her. Please. Moon smiles and lets go. We have a deal. You can go back to your corner and scream about how the war is wrong after this. But if you disappoint me. He then snaps his figure, making the point that whatever he will do will happen right after the vote. I think I should get my son. It is dinner time. I enjoyed our talk. As Moon walks inside his home, he feels his body sweating. He follows Moon inside his home and walks forward. He then sees his cat girl maid slave Dalico. Where is Sherry? She is still in their room, Dalico said. I just gave both of them some water. He nods and walks to Sherry's room. As he walks through the halls he can feel his heart pounding. He opens the door and sees Sherry and Skotardi sitting there. It looks like they were having a conversation about the Falamut League. Hi Papa, Sherry said with a big smile. We were just walking about recent events. We had a heated debate about allowing lesser races more rights, but we are at war after all, Skotardi. We must do what we must do. Yes we do Skotardi, he replies. Your father is ready for you. It was nice to finally meet you. Skotardi stands up and bows. Thank you for your hospitality, Senator. He waits until Moon and Skotardi leaves the house. He then walks to Sherry and hugs her. I love you so much, Sherry. She looks at him confused. Sadira, Royal Palace, War Room. General Herm Fuelmayo is sitting at the table, feasting on his meal. Zorzel walks over and pats him on the back. It is good to have you have. He then snaps his figure. Caslita. More food and wine. He looks over, wondering who Caslita is. He sees this blue cat girl walk over with a tray. He notices that she has a black eye and is shaking a little. The black eye seems like she was hit in the eye and not being natural like some cats have. I take it that she is your new fuck toy. Zorzel smirks. One of many forms of my entertainment. He smirks, missing this lifestyle. He watches as Caslita refills his wine and places more grapes and meat on the table. He sees Caslita glances at him nervously. He looks at her and then suddenly reaches out, scaring her. As she runs away, he and Zorzel laugh at how weak she is. By the gods, I miss this. He looks around and sees the others in the room laughing. Generals Kalasta, Padawan, Torturous, and Mudra, all of his friends. It must have been worse than the hell's pit living there, Padawan said. It was a special kind of hell, he replies. Their food is horrible and get this, they let women integrate me. I have to admit, I talked. I thought it was hysterical on how stupid they are. He then hears the Minotaur feet walk up. He turns around and sees Torturous. So, what have I missed? We are planning a massive counteroffensive against the other worlders. I have been having my night's training with the Orcs Wolf Riders. We are going to make them bleed. Torturous says as he picks up a leg and starts eating. Counteroffense, he asked, confused. What did I see in the Dumar Mountains then? It looked like you all were building defensives. Zorzel walks over. That is phase one. 
while you were gone, I established relations with the Scorless Kingdom and the Tikarek Conglomerate. I also made a treaty with the Moon Elves. What the Emperor is saying is we are about to give some pain to these bastards, Padawan said. I see, he said. I didn't know all this was happening while I was gone. Kalasta finishes his wine glass and looks at him. So, tell us. He looks at his oldest friend Kalasta. Both of them were part of Princess Pina Rose Knight's academy before joining Zorzal. They came from lower houses and used the Rose Knights to increase their station and favor of Zorzal. It took a few years but in the end, it worked. Tell you what, he asked. How you killed that bastard Chrysist, Zorzal says. In your reports, you said you defeated Chrysist and Legatus Proprieta Palu Muilk. He hesitates to laugh as he looks around at everyone. He sees everyone looking at him, wondering what he is going to say. Tell Boro thank you for that da. What we did was kidnap Muilk and feed him to the warehouse. That confuses me, Kalasta said. He always was loyal to the Empire and was very respected to the people in Ellie's. Herm nods his head and finishes his wine. I explained what was going to happen. We were going to purge Chrysis and his army once and for all. Muilk said while he didn't agree with everything Chrysis represents but he was going to stand by his side to the end. So, I helped him accomplish his goal. I just wished I slit the throat of that damn pink siren guardian, he says as he eats. By Edo's she got annoying quickly. What was her name, Baluti? Anyway, she always asking about Muilk. And then she betrayed me. Her betrayal prevents me from saving the fortress and killing your sister. He hears everything laughing, mentioning how silly Muilk was for siding with Chrysist. He chuckles and leans back. Then I used the Darboro provided to take Muilk's body. It seemed that both of them trusted each other because Crisis never once thought I replaced the Legatus. During the arena fight with Sharp and Crisis, I surrounded the area and waited for them to be weakened, that is when I attacked. He then stands up, pridefully for being the general who defeated Crisis's army. While we attacked the arena, my forces swept through the ranks and crucified Crisis's army while they were asleep. We easily overwhelmed the rest with Talin's help. Zorzal walks around. And yet my sister escaped. That was not my fault, he counters. I was busy fighting Chrysis. Talin was the one who lost your sister and laid the seeds of the defeat at Legrath. So, you are the bastard. He stops and wonders who said that. He turns around and sees Queen Famulis. His eyes widen as his eyes gaze at the white, purple, and black-colored succubus. She stands there with her wings folded close. She looks beautiful and intimidating at the same time. Succubus and Incubus were once powerful and noble people. They just enjoyed the sexual side of their kind more than most races. However, they were very influential throughout Fallmart for thousands of years. Before the Empire, many considered them part of the common races. They were seen as symbols of true love, following the mate of fate philosophy, which allows them to genuinely love a person of any race without seduction. When the empire started to expand, they were considered the first true target as sex slaves. Before the warrior bunnies, before the cat people it was the succubus and incubus. The empire turned them into a weak beast that can be tamed, turning them from the common races to the dark races. No threat, seen in a, object if anything. However, the succubus who is called Famulis, the most feared woman in Fallmart. He can't believe he is witnessing her, only hearing stories about her from Svenhard Lapu's moon. He was informed that Zorzal is going to marry Famulis to solidify their alliance, bringing the common races and dark races together against NATO. The sight of her scares him deeply. He gets on his knee. Your Highness. It is an honor to meet you. The stories about you do not do justice. Famulis walks through the room and stops right next to him. Right behind her is the brown hair warrior bunny maid Alonbula. Rays. He stands up and looks down at her. Right then Famulis slaps him in the cheek, knocking a tooth out. He falls right to the ground. What was that for? Mudra asked. For being rescued, Famulis said. We lost a vital spy network in Alnus. Alnus. 
the heart of the enemy occupation, where the gate is. As he lays there on the ground, he watches her slowly walk around him and then to Zorzal's side. He can see the hint of fear in everyone's eyes, even torturers who never scared of anyone. It is so quiet that he can hear the boots clink as Famulize walks around. Her warrior bunny maid and bodyguard follows close behind. The only man he notices who isn't afraid is Zorzal. It is either because he isn't worried about being murdered by Famulize or he just isn't scared he doesn't know. He takes a deep scared breath. He knows he has been lying on some details and stretching the truth on others. He doesn't want them to know that Princess Pina defeated him in combat, a woman who is weaker physically and emotionally beaten him in a fair duel. They will never think highly of him again if they find out. My queen, Zorzal said. Be more respectful of my friend. He has had a horrible journey to get back home. I promise the price was worth it. Famuli stops. Her warrior bunny maid stops beside her. Famuli then looks directly at him, like she is reading his mind. She then looks back at Zorzal. Besides, we gave up a massive advantage to NATO, Famuli said. We need that spy network so we can know what's going on in Alnus. You gave up an important assist that we cannot replace. He better be worth it. We can always put new spies in Alnus, Zorzal says as he brushes off her concerns. You don't get it, none of you, Famuli said, annoyed by their lack of concerns. They now know how our spy network works. Our biggest advantage is how little they know of our world and how it works. The more they understand us, the stronger they are. We need that information if we are going to have a chance. He gets up from the ground. I promise it was. I have insight knowledge of these other worlders. I see them fight firsthand. We shall see, Famuli said in an annoyed tone. I would hate to find out we lost because we wasted resources to save you. Now, I like you to finish your story of how you killed General Chrysist. That bastard defeated my armies in the frontier between our nations many times. I want to know how he died. As he sits down, he thinks back on his fight with Chrysist in the arena. The fight with Pina was intense however Chrysist was a force of nature. If it wasn't for the fact that he ambushed him and that he was already wounded by the Dar sneak attack, he knows he would have been dead. While he defeated him in the match, Chrysist's apostle prevented him from giving the final blow. While Chrysist had to be dead from all the wounds he suffered and Freyan was cut into pieces and spread across Fallmart. Chrysist has to be dead, he knows he is, but that story might not convince them. He takes a deep breath and notices Zorzal and Famuli starting to bicker again, about his rescue. He can see that she really hates the idea he is here. Seeing them argue like a married couple he decided to change the topic. She can see that Famuli is not pleased that he escaped, she explains that it was not worth losing their Hario spy network. Zorzal counters by saying regaining a general who has seen the enemy at first hand was worth the loss of their spy network, and that they know enough about the enemy. While I was on my way back, I saw a strong force being mobilized. If you were able to recruit those sand dogs Tikaret to your side, you must have a big plan. Zorzal breaks from the argument and looks at him. We are planning on hitting NATO with overwhelming from all directions. But Darwin then laughs. And once we take Alnus back we will invade their world and seek revenge. He sees everyone except Famulize laughing. He wants to laugh, but then reflects on his time at Alnus. While NATO is powerful, he did notice some weaknesses. They are all human and everything must come through the gate. Zorzal's plan to overwhelm them will be tough, but it could be done if they do it right. By Fallmart standards, they do not have enough men to conquer past what they already occupy. They rely too much on their technology, even though it is still a massive threat. He looks up at Zorzal. I do not think it is a good idea to go to Earth. Everyone stops laughing and looks at him, shocked by his attitude. We all know it will be a hard fight, but with our combined might we should be able to strike their world, Torturous said. But they value one life over many. We can throw waves after waves against them. Even their technology cannot keep up. And it is not like we haven't been adopting, Kalasta said. I have been working on balancing the odds to our favor. I also have been working with the Golrash Dwarf Kingdom. 
I have some prototypes I can show you. One is a repeater crossbow and a repeater scorpia. We've been having problems with jamming but started deploying it. Mudra then leans forward. And I have been working without allies in Rondel. The Hario tribe has discovered that the other worlders use magic waves of some kind to talk to each other. None of us understand what that means or how it work, but that is not the point. Point is, Kalaster interrupts. We think we found a way to use magic to interfere with their ability to communicate. We already tried it in the field. It seems to have some successes. We just don't know how to do it on a wide scale. He again sees them all laugh, but he doesn't laugh with them. While he is impressed by their advancements, they compare nothing to what he has seen, what he knows about Earth. It is not enough. When he gets everyone's attention again, he continues his point. Emperor Molt was an idiot to invade them. At the beginning of the war, we might have been fighting one nation, unlucky for us it is their most powerful one. Fulmart has a population of around 300 to 350 million common, beast, and darkling races however only 230 million of them are direct citizens or somewhere within the imperial hierarchy. The Americans have a total of 340 million people as their population alone, not including their allied nations. He can see all their eyes widen when they hear that number. They are all doing the math which means they haven't even faced the full manpower of the United States, and that does not include their vassals. If this was still early in the war then we could invade Earth again, but I don't think we can now, he continues. We are no longer fighting one nation, but many. We know, Mudra replies. We ready the spy reports about what NATO is. An alliance of many. Where did you think we got the idea from? Not my point, he said. I do not know if my interrogators were lying but even if the number is partly true, their world has 7 billion humans. We are fighting a full world and the only thing that is keeping us alive is how small the gate is. There is no way we could invade their world with the forces we have, even united. What else do you know? Famulis asked, thinking carefully about this new knowledge. He looks to her and glances away, not enjoying being ordered by a woman. We will never be able to invade their world and we only have seen a fraction of their forces. Kalasta places his hand on his chin as he thinks. These numbers do not add up. They are way too big, but even if some of it is true, we need to adjust our strategy. What we need to do is take the gate and close is, he proposes. Famulis takes a deep breath and crosses her arms. This is why we need to keep our spy network there. This is important information. Zorzal crosses his arm, looking at him. He is not happy about this latest news. We will consider this. But right now, we are celebrating your return. There will be time to talk about all of this later. He smiles, seeing everyone going back to small chatter and laughing. He is glad he does not have to answer more questions on what happened in Ellie's. He takes a glance at Famulis and sees her staring right through him as she sips her wine. Her eyes scare him to the bones. Sadira, Imperial Senate Chambers. March 17, 2026. Kaiso I.D. Tueli stands there on his side of the Senate floor. He feels tired and defeated after last night's visit with Svenhard Lapu's moon. He always stood on principle, voting for what he believed as the best for the Empire. But after his threat to his daughter, he doesn't know what to do now. He looks up to the throne and sees Emperor Zorzal sitting on his throne with a smirk on his face. Sitting in the newly built throne is for Empress Famulis. While Famulis is not Empress yet, the next vote will confirm it. He sees Senator Marcus walk into the Senate floor and holds up a scroll. I have the final count for the creation of the Fallmart League bill, Marcus said. The bill passed 91 to 9. The Empire officially creates the Fallmart League. He looks over to the pro-war side. They are all celebrating their victory. The creation of this league guarantees that the war will continue. He and Castle El Tiberius were able to convince most of the pro-peace faction to support this agreement as a compromise with the neutral faction. The agreement was that they would support the creation of this league and in return, they would stand united against Famulis marrying Zorzal and recognizing her in becoming empress. Now for the finale bill for today, Marcus said. 
the official senatorial vote on the marriage between Emperor Zorzal el Caesar and Queen Altoria Famulis of the Scorless Kingdom, leader of all the Suestuals kingdoms. He takes a look around the chamber. He can see many of the senators are nervous, from all sides. If someone said that the empire would be at wage against another world and forming alliances with traditional enemies, they would be laughed out of the senator floor. Then imagining the emperor marrying the dark queen herself, they would be called insane, but here they are. He notices crown prince Diabo El Caesar standing there. He looks calm for some reason, like he is taking mental notes of the situation. To the honorable senators, raise your hands if you support this bill, Marcus asked. He can see everyone looking around, many confused who will raise their hands first. He looks over to the pro-war side. Of course, he sees Senator and General Godeson raise his hand. He expects that, being a close friend of Zorzal. He has no principle so he never would vote against the Emperor. Then he notices no one else is raising their hands, all looking at each other. So far everyone is following the plan that he, Baron Montere, and Castle El Tiberius created. Does anyone second? Marcus asked. He takes a deep breath and stands up from his seat. He can see everyone looking at him as he walks into the center of the floor. The room goes silent and everyone tries to figure out what he is going to say. He stops and looks first to Zorzal and Famulis. Both have this puzzled look, Zorzal with an angry reaction and Famulis more curious look. My dear emperor, he said. I know you and I have not always seen eye to eye however we have always had the same goal. The salvation of the empire. We might have different ideas on how to accomplish that end however we are on the same path. He then turns around to look at all the other 99 senators. My fellow senators, I believe it is time for unity. This has been a hard war, hard times for now just for the people in this room but all citizens and freemen throughout Fulmart. Common race and dark race. For us to continue as a civilization we must put these differences aside and focus on the task at hand. He can see Montere and Tiberius looking at him, baffled, confused and angry at his sudden betrayal. He then sees Diabo with this shocked and now concern he is now. Diabo probably never expected him to ever make a statement like that, same with everyone else. That is why I, the head of the Tueli clan, fully endorse this union between our people and Empress Famulis's people, becoming one people. By extension I fully support the union between you two as emperor and empress of the empire to now and until the gods say enough. You have my vote. He can see both Zorzal and Famuli smiling, seeing that the winds are blowing in their favor. Your vote has been recorded, Marcus said. Please go back to your seat. He walks back to his seat. He can see that his fellow pro-peace senators feel betrayed. He does not blame any of them because that is the truth, he betrayed them. None of them know that there is one line he is not willing to cross, risking his family. When he sits down, he sees all the pro-war faction votes to support the marriage. He then sees Baron Monterey and his faction vote to support the marriage, seeing no choice now to support the bill. He looks to his faction and wonders if he will be part of it anymore. Most of them vote for the bill, feeling defeated and seeing no reason to oppose it. Only Tiberius and two others vote against the bill. The vote is 97 to 3, the bill is passed, Marcus yells. He then turns around to face the throne. All hail the emperor and empress. All hail the union of our people. 